Uh, my name is Rob Fuentes. I'm the president and CEO of the Eno Center for Transportation, and I want to welcome you to the latest in our series of Eno Center for Transportation webinars. Uh, today's webinar is Electric Vehicle Charging Networks, Strategies, Data, and Models for States. This is a particularly timely discussion. As we all know, the popularity of EVs is increasing rapidly. Uh, worldwide sales hit 6.6 .6 million in 2021, almost doubling from 2020. And factors like climate change and governmental commitments to reach net zero are helping drive these trends. But we know that at the same time, rising costs of materials, persistent shortages of microchips could damper EV growth. But also, so do concerns that at least in the United States, that we do not have the charging infrastructure that we need in many places to support transportation electrification. Mm -hmm. We all know the federal infrastructure bill that was passed last year provides $5 billion to states for new charging stations, along with another $2.5 billion um, that's gonna go out into, as discretionary money that states can apply for. So today we're gonna to discuss the policy implications of the IIJA, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, specifically how states can provide and prepare for an electric future. Uh, first, we're gonna hear from two experts at the Texas Transportation Institute. We have Joe Zietzman, Strategy Advisor and Assistant Agency Director at TTI, and Alice Grossman, Associate Research Scientist at TTI. Longer bios for both of them on our, are on the webinar webpage. And following them will be Ann Shu, the co-founder and CEO of Electro Tempo, an analytics as service spin-off company from TTI that's providing data insights regarding electrification and transportation. And after Ann is done, we will take questions. So please use uh, the questions function on the GoToWebinar website to submit. Thank you all for joining us today. And with that, take it away, Joe. Thank you very much, Rob. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to, to at this webinar. And I want to start out by thanking the Eno Center for Transportation for what they've done um, for my career. You know, I started off in 1998 coming to Texas A&M from South Africa and um, doing my PhD here on the topic of sustainable transportation. And I was fortunate enough to become an Eno Fellow and participated in the leadership workshop or conference in Washington, D.C. in 1999. Um, met some wonderful people, and I really want to thank Eno for that opportunity to help me launch my career. And I'm so glad that program is still, still ongoing, and um, I want to encourage folks to really look into that seriously. So thanks for that. So my job is just going to be to set the stage for my two esteemed colleagues, um, Alice and Anne, to speak after me and, and get into the details about electric vehicle charging network strategies, data, models for the states. And um, I'll start out by saying a few words about the CAR-T Center. And as you can see there, the, the logo is on the top right. And, and in the orange font, you'll see it stands for Center for Advancing Research in Transportation, Emissions, Energy and Health. And it's a university transportation center funded by the U.S. Department of Transportation. It's a consortium of universities um, led by TTI. And we also have Johns Hopkins, Georgia Tech, University of Texas, El Paso, and UC Riverside as partners in car -T. And as you can see from the title, we are focused on the intersection between health and transportation, specifically in the areas of energy and emissions. And you can imagine uh, with um, energy and emissions and the link to health, um, electric vehicles and electrification has been a, a strong focus at car -T for the past four or five years. And um, I will talk a little bit um, in more detail in terms of, next slide please, in terms of what we've been focusing on when it comes to vehicle electrification. So this slide lays it out in terms of the transportation electric grid convergence, and we see it as three big pieces coming together. Basically, the electric grid, which, al which also contains the microgrid, the infrastructure, which is basically the road infrastructure, as well as the chargers, and then also the vehicles. And the vehicles, obviously, with the battery technology and, and, and the electric motors. So these three pieces are really converging, and it becoming a, very much a multidisciplinary problem cannot only be solved by transportation professionals as it used to be the case in the past. So to that end, TTI and car -T has been very fortunate to collaborate very strongly with our partners at Electrical and Computer Engineering at Texas A&M. Um, they are true grid experts under the leadership of Tom Overby, who is an, a member of the National Academy of Engineering. 
And with Overby's group, we were able to combine some modeling efforts and expertise on the transportation side, also with the grid side. And doing that, we were able to start answering questions that we could not previously do by combining grid and transportation models. And one of those efforts led to the development of a charging demand software package, which um, got licensed and um, also led to the spin-off company that Ann Shu is leading now called Electro Tempo. So um, that has been, been very beneficial. We were able to license that software and Ann will speak in much more detail about Electro Tempo and what that software can do. So under CAR-T, it's one of our key pillars is to do technology transfers. So having Electro Tempo as a spin-off company and having that software, we can now really take it to market and make sure that what we developed on the research side can actually be implemented in, in, for the public and with our colleagues and partners at state DOT, cities, MPOs, etc. Next slide, please. The other two initiatives I just want to touch on here at CAR-T is on the left, you see our Environment and Emissions Research Facility. The building on the right is our existing Environment and uh, Emissions Research Facility that contains an environmental test chamber where we can control temperature and humidity. So that facility is big enough, the chamber, to take a full-size bus or a truck, the tractor and the trailer, we can control temperature and humidity in there so that we can perform our testing in under controlled conditions. We are expanding that facility so that it can also become an electric vehicle testing facility and we're very proud and very happy about that. So the building just to the left of that is actually a new building that uh, we're going to break ground on very soon and that will contain all the electrical components that we're going to need to make it a true vehicle to grid grid to vehicle testing facility that will include chargers load banks connection to the grid and to the microgrid as you see to the left we're also upgrading our existing facility so that we can sustain the temperature at minus 40 degrees because that is kind of the industry standard and is expected to be able to test batteries and vehicles at very cold temperatures and we are also including a heavy-duty chassis dynamometer so that we can also drive heavy-duty vehicles as well as light-duty vehicles inside the test chamber. This will enable us to answer a lot of questions that have traditionally not been able to be answered. We can provide information to stakeholders, to decision makers, and we will also be able to provide key information to the models that I discussed previously. So we're very excited about that development at um, our Aurelis campus here at TTI. And then finally, I just want to touch on the Clean Transportation Collaborative that's on the right of that slide. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's not a single disciplinary topic anymore. We need stakeholders from all sides of, 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 of the debate on the energy side, the electric side, transportation side, public, private, academics, to start talking to each other and collaborate. And to that end, we developed a clean transportation collaborative that's going to be uh, facilitated and, and run by CAR-T and TTI. And we are um, launching that collaborative in the middle of April. So please look out for that. And if anybody is interested in joining and collaborating and participating in these discussions and, and, and expanding on the ideas, please reach out to myself or Alice, and we'll be happy to discuss that with you and get you on board. So with that, Rob, I appreciate the opportunity and it's back to you. Thank you, Joe, very much. I'll turn it over to Alice Grossman. Great, thank you. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, so with that background on what some of the uh, research efforts are and facilities, um, that we're developing at TTI to support um, the work that states are doing in vehicle electrification and charging for uh, vehicle electrification. I'm going to talk a little bit about the federal and national framework with the, within which we're working and what states and regions are doing and how they're working together to be able to achieve some of these national goals and utilize the funds and 
uh, tie back to the policy that Rob was talking about in the introduction, looking at um, sort of historical policies and then obviously the Investment in Infrastructure and Jobs Act that was passed in November. Um, so we've kind of got a mix here of um, things we've been doing for a long time and things that we're really ramping up and getting started on doing now. So if you look at these federal goal areas, things like addressing climate change, looking at air quality, noise, public health, equity considerations, um, economic success, jobs and job creation, these are things, a lot of things that we've been talking about for a long time. Um, but what's new since November of 2021 is that we have a whole new set of policies and a whole new set of funding and financing mechanisms to work towards these federal goal areas. Um, so that's the, the in Investment in Infrastructure and Jobs Act that we talked about. Um, but we also have legacy policies like the Clean, Clean Air Act um, that really come into play here. So, you know, that's all the way back to maybe uh, thinking back, for example, to the Clean Air Act 1970, um, there are requirements for air quality attainment for metropolitan regions. And if an urban region doesn't reach a certain uh, attainment of air quality that we see as uh, good for the public health of the general public living in that area, then there are funding and planning requirements tied to that as well. There's also existing formula and discretionary programs. And if we go to the next slide, please, uh, we'll see a list of some of those that existed even before the IIJA passed in November. So when we're thinking about the opportunities for states to be planning and implementing, um, having this influx of guidance and funding opportunities is huge. Um, but we'll see that there have actually been also a lot of opportunities moving forward and that there are a lot of states that have started thinking about some of these elements for a long time. And that includes also going back to, you know, what Joe was saying and thinking about different stakeholders, um, even just looking at, at the energy mix. So when we talk about um, transportation electrification and goals towards things like air quality, um, and energy sustainability, the energy mix that's going into the grid is also important. Um, and so, you know, based now in Texas, for example, looking at those clean energy sources like wind and solar um, that you have in the state of Texas is going to have a big implication further on once we get to more electrification of transportation. Um, but I just wanted to point out a couple of the programs that we had that could fund transportation char electrification charging in the past. And you'll see um, that that's included in formula and discretionary programs that have existed. But the important thing to notice here is that most of these programs are also um, include eligibility for different types of programs so, or projects. So this isn't just about um, vehicle electrification and charging, um, but if you look at something like the CMAC funds, for example, um, states and MPOs might be able to use funding for that for all sorts of different uh, air quality and environmental projects like multimodal projects, looking at active transportation um, and things like that. So the thing that we really got out of the IIJA is getting some dedicated funding to go towards charging and some guidance to think about how to plan for electrification um that that we didn't have before and so that's incredibly important and that also opens up some of these other programs um, to be able to help us reach those goals again thinking about climate thinking about the economy thinking about equity thinking about air quality um, so that we can take a multi-layered approach and not just look at electrification of transportation, but also be able to use some of these programs to be able to fund uh, modal switch and thinking about some of the other ways to achieve those goals as well. Next slide, please. So what you might have noticed also both from the IIJA and from some of those other programs um, is that this is really becoming a state initiative. So while we now have this guidance and framework from the federal government, um, it's up to the states to really think about how they're going to plan for EV charging um, and how they're going to think about and look at what the fleet penetrations are going to be, both from the public side and the private side and looking at general public fleets. Um, and so what do states need to be thinking about when they're doing this um, and how do we put all of these pieces together? 
And so we've talked about some of the policies behind that, and that is often coming um, from the top down, although you'll also see localities that have started really thinking about clean transportation options. And so getting that collaboration um, from the local to regional to state to national level um, is something that can be done in all sorts of ways. Um, and then we've got the air quality, energy, and transportation modeling, which Joe also mentioned. Um, now we've got a whole other sector that we're bringing into that. This is not just transportation demand modeling anymore. Um, there's a whole bunch of other elements. Uh, and that's what Anne is going to be talking about more in depth later. So I'm going to hold off on that for a little bit. Um, funding identification, we covered a little bit. Um, Public health assessments and the air quality and energy model, modeling are a huge element of this. Um, and that's one of the reasons why our center uh, at TTI, which looks at energy emissions and public health, is particularly interested in and positioned to be looking at clean transportation options um, because it's looking at this as an entire ecosystem and thinking about the travel behavior and emissions associated with vehicular travel and how that has an effect on people who are living in the community every day and being able to look at those changes and really monitor you know with different types of, of vehicles different types of traffic patterns um, different policies different planning how are we monitoring this and are we working towards those areas of success and those goals that we set out towards at the very beginning uh, and then the last element here is the um, stakeholder engagement next slide please so we're going to talk a little bit more about that um, and that's something that we're getting very involved with, um, starting in the state of Texas and kind of looking a little more broadly as well. And you also have to think about, again, the relationships between um, regional movement in terms of uh, movement between states within a state um, and then on a national level as well. If you think about, for example, the Port of Houston um, and the national implications of all of the goods that are moved through there and then through the state of Texas every day. Um, so the stakeholder engagement is a little bit more advanced than what we've been doing in transportation for the last however many years um, because we're pulling in this entire sector of energy that while it has been a part of transportation planning before and you can look at for example um, you know the oil crisis in the 1970s and we saw a big change on transportation patterns um, then now we have a whole bunch of different uh, energy um, sources coming into play and we have the utilities and getting that energy transfer into personal vehicles, municipal fleets, commercial fleets, um, it, freight transportation, personal transportation, etc. So getting that cross-disciplinary communication and understanding and data interoperability um, is something that we're all still working on um, and need to do as quickly and efficiently as possible to be able to get that planning for electrification done and utilize the funds that have been made available through the federal government and other resources as we move forward. And so this is also bringing together the public sector, the nonprofit sector, the private sector, the research community um, such as ourselves to be able to help figure out how to plan for this and monitor as we go along and measure success towards our goals. Um, which when you look at it, there's a lot of shared goals. So stakeholder engagement, while it seems overwhelming um, and, and extensive, um, being able to work towards these goals of better public health, health, efficient use of public and private space, equitable access, um, cleaner air, you know, these are things that we can work work together around and so finding the, those synergies and commonalities is what's going to help us move forward with our planning. Next slide please. So enable to do to be able to do this in both a qualitative and quantitative way we have a whole bunch of data needs um, and so that's looking at some of those traditional transportation and land use data elements that a lot of transportation professionals are familiar with um, with energy and utility uh, data, such as different infrastructure elements and usage, um, pull on the electric grid, for example, um, and looking at extremes. So Joe mentioned earlier that, you know, we want to be able to test batteries at, you know, negative 40 degrees. Um, 
we can't measure those extremes and look at, well, what happens if there's an extreme weather event? Um, what happens if half of the grid goes out? Um, are we able to create some sort of microgrid looking at electric vehicles and their, the batteries um, associated with them? Um, so that's a whole new element in figuring out how to integrate some of those data with the traditional transportation and land use data um, is stuff that Anne is working on that has been really impressive and helpful to be able to move forward in our planning process in that sort of quantitative way. Um, and then, of course, I always think that this is the hardest part, um, and I guess it depends on where you're coming from and what you're doing, but then we also have the data about people, which is predicting what people will do, so looking historically at what we have been doing, um, but when we're looking at an electric vehicle landscape, you know, just looking at things like adoption, we can look at the models and see the incentives that come through, like the tax incentives of the IIJA, um, and we can look at people's current driving patterns and refueling patterns, um, but estimating what that's going to be in the future uh, is often one of the, the, the human element is, is one of the most complex and interesting elements of this as well. And we need to be able to pull those data in too and do the models in different scenarios to the best of our abilities. Next slide, please. Great. So pulling back out, as I said at the beginning, it's really coming down to states to be able to move forward implementing and making change and planning for electrification and the charging needs associated with that. And a lot of states have been working on this. Um, and one of the things I want to point out on this map that shows which states have publicly available um, planning elements or policy elements for vehicle electrification um, is that Almost all of the states, and I have not looked into every single one of the 50 states plus DC plus Puerto Rico yet, um, are working on it. And especially since the passage of the IIJA, um, these plans are in development and um, there will be publicly available information soon. Um, but this is even before the passage of the infrastructure bill um to see that we were already moving in this direction and so to get that support for guidance for planning and funds to support what we're working on at the state level um, is incredibly helpful as well next slide please great so i'm going to go through a couple of examples and uh, then we're going to be able to get into some of the good technical data and modeling going on behind this um, so I'm going to start quickly with the state of North Carolina that has been working on their zero emission vehicle planning for quite a while. Um, and their plan includes looking at those estimates in terms of what the market growth and demand estimates are going to be for charging. Um, and then what the readiness assessment for charging is. So if you think back to that map, a lot of states have already been planning for um, electrification. And so we actually have decent databases uh, across the country of where charging stations already are and how they're being utilized. So be able, being able to look at that historical information can also help us plan for the future and is an important part of any sort of charging plan that we're doing at a state or regional level. Um, the stakeholder engagement element, um, getting an MOUs with the freight sector, with the public transit sector, um, and looking at vehicle acquisition and um, driving patterns at those levels, as well as the general public, is also a really important element to put into plans. And North Carolina has a good example of doing those, as well as working with the um, electricity and utility uh, uh, stakeholders in their state and region as well. And then just going back to this uh, basic element of funding, which is always one of the backbones that we have to worry about, um, there's the IIJA funding and all of those formula and discretionary programs that I mentioned um, that were in existence even before that. And then what a lot of states are doing, um, and this is something that I found in quite a number of states that I've looked into their electric vehicle charging plans um, and uh, some climate action plans and resilience plans, um, is using those funds from the Volkswagen settlement back in 2017 um, when they were out of compliance in terms of the amount of emissions that their vehicles were emitting. Um, and so those funds have gone towards states to be able to implement uh, charging 
networks for, for electric vehicles and other things like that. And it's a common use of funds, um, especially while waiting for the influx coming in from the federal government moving forward. Next slide, please. So Texas is one of the states that is working on developing their planning for clean transportation and electric vehicle charging. Um, and in parallel to what North Carolina and a lot of other states are doing is thinking hard about that stakeholder engagement between different sectors um, in the transportation and energy realms, as well as the public and private sector. And again, connecting with freight um, as a state that has um, important and active ports uh, moving through it, as well as a lot of personal travel on roadways. Um, that's a lot of volume and a lot of stakeholders to bring together. Um, so that is an important element to, to all states, but especially ones that have more complex systems, um, such as the state of Texas. Um, they have the DOT leading the planning efforts for this. So TxDOT has been working um, on planning for electric vehicle charging. Um, and again, you know, we think about sort of stakeholder engagement in this interdisciplinary aspect as something that is going across, um, you know, from the Department of Transportation to the um, Public Utility Commission, but even within DOT, getting that coordination between divisions um, is something that TxDOT is working on. So you have people who work in the environmental division talking to people who work in the planning division and being able to get that interdisciplinary collaboration internally is also something um, that can really help states work forward and accelerate and cre create a holistic plan moving forward on these things. Um, and then also when we go back to thinking about that um, diagram with the bubbles and all of the elements here. And so thinking back again to those quantitative elements of bringing in the data um, and thinking about sort of how we do that modeling and monitoring and assessment. Um, and that's kind of where our, uh, us as researchers at TTI and Anna at Electro Tempo, um, the kind of software that she builds um, can come in and provide technical support to be able to really say, you know, we've got these data, we can pull the data together, we have the models, we have the expertise behind this. And so if we're looking at it, for example, um, the air quality impacts of changing the mix of the um, sleeps on the roads from internal combustion engine to maybe electric, maybe we're getting um, hydrogen fuel cell buses at transit agencies and bringing together all of that information to, again, do those predictions and run those models and provide the technical support for the big picture planning um, that TxDOT and other agencies are working on at different states. Um, so then, yeah, lastly, I'll talk very briefly on this Houston Metro example, and then we're going to get into some of those technical details from Anne. Um, and that is, again, we're thinking about this, you know, states really are taking the lead, but we've got that connection coming down from the federal government and the connections coming up from the local and regional levels. And so if you look at urban regions, a lot of them um, have already been working on developing charging networks and thinking about how this is going to change the urban and suburban fa fabrics where they are. And so finding those connections and getting states and urban regions to work together to create a more holistic version and not um, replicate or duplicate work is also an important part of this. Um, and once you do that kind of in one metro area, especially within the same state that has the same policy framework and has some of the same values and goals, um, you can also create a, a replicable model um, or framework that you can move from metro area to metro area, perhaps even past state lines as well. Um, so that's an important element of collaboration as well. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Anne to talk even more about the, the data and modeling and needs at the state and regional levels. You can go to the next slide, please. Thank you, Alice. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Ann Shu. I'm co-founder and CEO of Electro Tempo. We're a software company focusing on charging network planning and intelligence. Next slide, please. So who are we? Uh, we are founded uh, we were founded in 2020 out of Texas A&M. Um, we are an analytics as a service company, 
providing critical data insights for transportation electrification. Um, we unify data and simulation in infrastructure um, to integrate a lot of the data elements that Alice just mentioned, um, including transportation demand, grid assets, land use, demographics, and emissions, so that all the stakeholders can come together and optimally accelerate EV development, uh, deployment, maximize return, and measure impact. Um, since our founding, we've had quite a few accomplishments. We were selected by the US DOE Vehicle Technologies Office to model truck charging, uh, electric char truck charging demand um, on the I-45 alternative fuel corridor and the Dallas and Houston urban areas on, on both ends. We recently closed a round of venture capital funding with Schematic Ventures. We were selected as the vendor for Evolve Houston um, in Houston's Regional Infrastructure Strategy for Electrification, or RISE. Um, so I'll talk a bit more about that experience in, um, as a follow-up to what Alice just mentioned about the Houston metro area's um, efforts. And we have a rapidly growing team of experts in utilities, transportation, and computer, uh, computer science to advance the field. Next slide, please. So the problem uh, that you know, we're focused on today is how do we estimate key metrics required by the bi bipartisan infrastructure law, the bell? Um, there are two parts to the bell. Uh, the first part is the formula program, the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program, or NAVI. Um, in the formula program, uh, the goals are to accelerate equitable adoption of EVs and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In addition, there are um, discretionary grants. So there's the discretional grant program for charging and fueling infrastructure, and that is designed to target priorities such as rural charging, resiliency, climate change, charging acts, and charging access. Um, in disadvantaged communities. Um, as Alice mentioned, ultimately the burden is put on the states to, to develop strategies uh, that meet these goals um, in, uh, so that the federal funding is spent in a way that is both measurable in terms of impact and that deploys infrastructure effectively in the most equitable way possible. Next slide, please. As a software company, what we bring, uh, the solution we bring to the problem uh, that we're discussing today is a suite of three products. Um, the first one is called a charging demand forecast. Um, for this, in this pro product, we provide region-wide um, charging demand simulation temporarily resolved to the hour and spatially resolved up to the street block. And the primary customers are utilities, charging service providers, and property owners as potential charging uh, charger hosts. The primary use cases are to identify hotspots of, of charging, um, charging demand and identify grid upgrades need, uh, needs and forecast electricity and charging revenue and prioritize charging station size. In, re in relation to impact assessment, we also have um, prod a product that um, takes into account carbon accounting and impacts, and that's mostly for governments, nonprofit organizations, and corporations with sustainability goals. In this suite of products, we account for both the grid side emissions and the tailpipe, the mobile source emissions. So um, these solutions are there to meet air quality regulations, environmental justice and equity concerns, and carbon reductions. And these two products are more on the planning side of, um, side of things. And in, in the spirit of moving the planning um, efforts towards deployment, we also have fleet electrification tools that are geared towards 
fleet operators and auto and truck manufacturers. And these, uh, this product is um, primarily used to reduce visibility assessment time and accelerate electric vehicle sales and optimize operations schedule to reduce electricity cost and vehicle payback time. Next slide, please. So um, underlying these, these uh, products is a technology stack that includes a lot of the data elements that, that Alice mentioned. So we have three layers, the one, a data layer, an anal analytics layer, and a visualization layer built on the cutting edge um, software technology. And I would like to point out that our technology, as you can see, is very modular in that we can um, we can easily scale across urban areas using the data and the models for that particular um, area and build it, incorporate that into the rest of our stack so that we can uh, apply our, our solutions to other areas and to, to uh, statewide efforts. And in this technology stack, um, I would like to point out two simulation engines that are core to our offering. One is a vehicle ownership simulation model. It's a Markov model, agent-based Markov model that simulates vehicle adoption so that we can translate all the different types, um, projection curves out there to into actual vehicle adoption levels by vehicle type, adjusting for different incentives and policy initiatives and availability of, um, of vehicle models. The other one is a charging behavior uh, simulation model. So it's based on empirical, um, ex empirical evidence of charging behavior and incorporates travel demand and vehicle dynamics to forecast uh, charging demand by demand type. Next slide, please. So this technology offering is currently being, is cur currently adopted by Evolve Houston in their RISE initiative. Um, so we are the analytics backbone for RISE to as assess costs required for charging station requirement, identify charging hotspots, anticipate grid upgrade needs, and ensure equitable distribution of charging stations. And ultimately, we can help the stakeholders calculate greenhouse gas and air quality benefits. And a little bit more on um, this initiative, this is an example where different stakeholders come together. So Evolve Houston is a consortium of uh, government and private entities, including the city of Houston, NRG, Centerpoint, um, the local, their local utility, Shell, and University of Houston. So with our um, shared view, um, we are able to bring all of the stakeholders to the, to the table um, and discuss the optimal way to deploy future charging stations. And on this particular slide, you can see a, a screenshot of the uh, web dashboard that we provide to Evolve Houston. Next slide, please. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, one of the key, um, the, uh, our core technologies is a charging demand simulation. So as we see it in all of the charging infrastructure deployment, all of the discussions about bringing the transportation sector and the power, electric power sector together, the binding element is charging. That's when the transportation sector interfaces with the electric power sector. So to be able to simulate charging demand is a key task. And on this slide right here, you see two animations showing our simulation hour by hour. On the left, you, what you see is um, home charging demand. On, on the left is public charging demand. So you can see the uh, progression of charging demand um, as the day goes on. And this 
on the the data that underpins the two animations, and we have this for workplace charging as well, um, as well as uh, medium and heavy duty charging. So the data underpinning these simulations are what brings the transportation side and the utilities together. Next slide, please. So in the next few slides, I'm going to show you a, a few examples of the actual use cases of um, the charging demand simulation. First one is the electricity demand and costs. So if you read the guidance for NAVI uh, from the Federal Highway Administration, they specifically talk about how the charging infrastructure plan is supposed to analyze um, the electricity demand from charging and our product can be used for that purpose. And we can look at both the total um, demand and peak demand. That allows um, stakeholders to assess infrastructure cost and overall operations cost, because the electricity cost um, has a lot to do with the, the total demand um, with the component on peak of peak demand. Um, but the infrastructure cost actually has a lot to do with what the peak demand is. So in our application with Evolve Houston, um, in the RISE initiative, we estimated that approximately $400 million of new investment will be needed. And that's both on the charging infrastructure, the chargers themselves, and the, the grid upgrades. So uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to talk a bit more on this topic of a topic of peak demand and grid upgrade um, requirements. So what you see on this slide is an overlay of the charging demand uh, simulation and the electric electric substations. So by overlaying these uh, two elements, we have the ability to evaluate future charging demand against the current capacity con constraints of grid substations. We're actually in active conversations with different utilities so that we can bring the insights into electric vehicle charging demand uh, to the utilities themselves and overlay the charging demand forecast on utilities internal analysis. The time element of our simulation allows users to identify areas with likely peak demand constraints. So utilities and project developers can get ahead of the problem. Next slide, please. Um, so what I did, so just now I talked about the grid upgrade requirement um, example, and that is mostly for uh, talking with the utilities. But of course there is a diverse um, there are diverse stakeholders in the e-mobility system, and one of them um, is the charging service providers and the property uh, owners as potential charger hosts. And they need to figure out whether or not there's revenue potential or there's even a need to add more chargers. So our analytics break down the gaps in existing infrastructure coverage based not just on present demand, but projected future demand. And um, these the EV infrastructure needs are not always obvious, especially if you're talking about what fu projected future demand might be. So here is an example of the two airports in Houston. There's the Hobby Airport and the Bush Airport. The Hobby Airport is the, the image you see on the left, and the Bush Airport is the image you see on the right. So um, our, analytic, our, our analytics shows that the demand at Hobby Airport is projected to be covered fairly well. Um, you see the, the darker shade of pink, um, whereas the demand at uh, Bush Airport is not, despite having more current charging stations. And this is based on the, the simulated charging demand based on travel demand patterns. Um, next slide, please. Um, and we've talked a lot about um, equity. So here's an example of how our dashboard is being used in um, 
in the equity analysis of charging infrastructure deployment. So you can, are in, on this, in this view, the blue dots represent the, the proportion of families below poverty line. So you can see that um, uh, the current EV infrastructure is largely concentrated on high income areas. So, so more, the more dots there are in an area, the, the higher percent of low income families there are. And by doing such overlays, we um, help users to identify where equitable investment can unlock latent demand. Next slide, please. Um, we are, um, I want to touch on emissions because this is actually very difficult to do, especially if one would like to um, consider both the grid side emissions and the uh, mobile source emissions. And our analytics have been have proven critical in a couple of studies. Um, the one on the left is a study of grid side power generation emissions. So um, our collaborators from uh, Texas A&M University, the in, in, uh, electrical engineering group, um, they actually did a large scale grid side uh, simulation using the analytics we provide to show that EVs can reduce power sector emissions, e emissions even in today's grid, if today's grid can, can, the grid infrastructure can support large scale EV charging demand. So the blue dots are actually the, the circles in that in this map show every power plant in Texas and the blue ones showed reductions and the red ones show potential increase and you can see more blue than red in this map. And on the right um, is a mobile source emissions map and we were able to actually run it for the entire Houston region using AirMod to show the actual dispersion impacts of reduced uh, PM 2.5 emissions from large scale, potential large scale e, um, truck electrification. I did include a um, citation there. It's public, the report is published on CAR-T's data hub. Um, so check it out if you're interested. Next slide, please. So um, to wrap up, I wanna highlight the relevance of our software solution to the EV infrastructure, to, to the, uh, the bill, the bipartisan infrastructure law. First of all, let's talk about NAVI. Um, before uh, the immediate, the most immediate need for NAVI, of course, is the state DOT EV infrastructure plans. And in this plan, the state DOT, state DOTs are asked to provide necessary information on grid capacity and peak demand. And these are infra, the, these are um, metrics that our software is well positioned to provide. But after that, the NEVI formula program funds can also be used for, um, and I quote the Federal Highway Administration guidance, number seven, mapping and analysis activities to evaluate in an area um, in an area to forecast the quantity of electricity required to serve EV charging stations and to evaluate different adoption and use scenarios um, for EVs and EV charging stations. Um, with our simulation capability, we're well positioned to conduct such scenario analysis for state DOTs and, and its stakeholders. Next slide, please. And as, as a relates to the discretional grant program. Um, there actually are, is one on the street already um, called RACE. It's already been released. And RACE specifically calls out um, several factors that electrotemples analytics are particularly well positioned to address, including zero emission vehicle infrastructure, equity, um, transportation options to underserved communities, improve commercial system operations and velocity of goods movement and partnership models. At the end of the day, um, our solutions provide the shared view and that's where, that's how we um, are able to, uh, that's how we enable partnerships um, to, 
um, on both the public side and private side to come together and, uh, and um, apply for the RAISE grant. Next slide, please. So um, in the end, just wanted to share my contact information and please check out our website, uh, electrotempo.com for more information and uh, follow our link LinkedIn profile uh, for updates. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anne. And thank you, Alice and Joe. Um, really interesting stuff. And, and judging from the questions, we have a lot of, lot of interest in the topic and I know that um, we've just barely started to to scratch the surface with all this, and and given the conversations over the next next few years, there's going to be a lot more. But I th I think we can kind of group these 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 set of questions into three big categories. There's a lot of questions about the planning piece, kind of that you walked through, Alice, and what the you know what the state world is there. Questions about the model, and then some very specific Texas questions. I'm going to try to get into each of those just very quickly. And I think probably the best way to address the planning. A lot of folks are curious. I think what the requirements are here. So clearly you're working with the state of Texas in order to develop a plan in order to figure out the best way to deploy EV charges around the state. What's the what's the genesis for that? Is that something that was stimulated by the IIJA? Are other states doing it? Are there requirements for planning? There's a little more background of the genesis of the plan that you're developing. Yeah, so as Anne mentioned, the guidance for NEVI formula funds is um, out already. And so that has uh, some of the requirements for the planning elements for states to be looking at to receive those formula funds for the electrical, electric vehicle charging networks. Um, and then also, yeah, for the discretionary programs, again, like Ann mentioned, RAISE, formerly Bill, formerly Tiger, um, the NOFOs for those programs are also going to have um, things that are requirements and things that are just kind of, uh, well, you're more likely to get funds uh, if you do certain things. Um, and I honestly am also going to point people right back to ETW who are interested. And, you know, as more um, of the regulations and NOFOs come out, I know that Jeff Davis will be covering those very extensively um, and helping people make some sense out of what that federal um, regulation and guidance says. Thank you for the commercial. It's Eno Transportation Weekly for those of you who don't know. Thank you, Alice, for that. And so you had one slide that showed that Texas is not one of the states with a plan now. Is that kind of the point that you're helping them develop this plan, and then that'll be shaded into with the uh, with the um, the understanding that all the other states that were shaded in have already gone through a similar exercise? Not necessarily. Um, and I would say that of uh, you know the states that do have publicly available plans and policies. Some of those are much less extensive than what a lot of states are working on now with the IIJA funds and requirements coming out. Um, and so it's it's really state by state in terms of how extensive the, the different plans are. Um, and yeah, one of, I, I might t turn it over to Joe to talk a little more about what TechStot is doing. Um, but I would say that that is one of those examples that's that's looking at lots of different elements and pulling in different different stakeholders for the plan. Joe, did you have more? Yeah, so what I'll add is TechStart has been very proactive and um, they have really been on top of this issue and saw it coming. So they've been working internally, um, getting them, themselves situated to, to de develop the plan. And I think what, what's an important point that we realized is a plan will be developed, but then it will be refined over time. And I think that's something the states will, will realize. You know, you're going to actually meet the needs, but then there's a lot of refinement that's going to take place. And I think that's where TechStart is. We are assisting TechStart on the air quality side and on conformity because it's a very, very important topic, how it relates to emissions. And so we're assisting on that side. And our assistance will hopefully flow into the planning as they, as they move forward. One more on the planning. Um, obviously, in Texas, it's a big place. But is there any requirements that states plan together? That there's planning between states, particularly it looks like here in the Northeast, smaller states that are closer together. Any requirements that they that they do collaborative planning? Not that I know of. Alice, do you want to take that? I was going to say, I'm going to admit, I, I'm not going to definitively say no, but there are none that uh, initially come to mind. But there are a number of regions that are coming together to do planning between states. 
Um, and so, you know, I think there's a Southeast region group that's working together, uh, Pacific Northwest group, the um, Northeastern states. So there's a lot of that happening. Um, but whether or not it, it's required, I, I can't answer that off the top of my head. It's definitely a good idea and it's, it's definitely happening. <laughs> I think that's right, I think that's right. And, and um, questions on the, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, I think a lot of the questions here on the model focus on this issue, on this, this question of equity, right? That you, that you laid out. I can just tell when the questions were coming in based on what you, heard, what you were saying. And the one question I think kind of sums it up really well here. So how do you model for the amount of benefit that chargers provide to disadvantaged communities, especially when there's, you know, when there's low income or, or low um, car ownership in those, in those places? How do you model for the differences of the needs from low income neighborhoods to, to other neighborhoods? So I think we, our key philosophy here is that we design an EV future um, coming from a place where the way the world as it's supposed to be instead of the way the world is. So we model um, the EV charging demand based on the assumption that they should have the equal access to EVs. And that I think is a key difference from our approach, between our approach and a lot of other approaches based on existing EV um, usage because there is no existing EVs in those areas. So um, I think that's that's how we come to the equity and and talk about the difference. And the inputs then are different from low income neighborhoods from to from other neighborhoods. And how do you how do you account for those different variables? So we just um, you know we model vehicle adoption level as if they would right as if the low income areas should have the same adoption levels as rich um, neighborhoods. That's what I meant as for the world as it should be. Um, and the charging demand is based on travel demand because ultimately EVs are a mode of transportation. They are there to meet the, the travel demand. Much more questions, I'm sure, on the, on the model as, as the work that you're doing goes forward and, um, and good luck with the, with the application in, in, Texas, in Houston and, and elsewhere. Um, and thank you all very much for for um, for the questions. We couldn't come come close again to all of these. Um, if this for this uh, video will be posted on our YouTube site, um, we'll send these questions to the to the, to the speakers so they have those. And if you'd like more information about Eno, you can check out our website at www.enotrans.org. Um, while you're there, you should check out uh, Eno Transportation Weekly, as Alice already plugged for us. Um, it's the source of a lot of things on transportation. Um, all up and down the, the, the scope. Um, and while you're there, also check out our classes and our courses. We have our Transit Senior Executive course coming up. I think applications are closed for that, but Transit Transportation Mid-Manager, um, a couple of those sessions coming up this year. So um, yeah, please please be on the lookout for those. Uh, and once again, just my thanks to, to Anne, to Alice, and to, to Joe um, for joining us here today and sharing all this really exciting work with us. This is something that obviously is profoundly important in a lot of states are looking for, um, for for their own solutions. So thank you for providing this for us. Um, and with that, we'll close it off here. Good afternoon, everybody. Be very well. Thank you.